uh, we're having all of these crazy ice storms um, in places that uh, that haven't been uh, expecting them. Very unusual weather. And um, should this be happening in a place near you, what are you going to do about it? You could sit inside um, or um, be, care be careful on the ice. You could go outside and play. And so I want to show you just, uh, I'm going to start with some general kind of winter snowy journaling pages uh, that um, I did when I was uh, um, up in Plumas County in California. Um, there's a, a number of schools out there, out there um, pre-COVID regularly visiting and doing nature journaling um, with students in those, in those schools. And here it was the middle of winter. So you're, you're thinking like, what, what can you, what's, what's going on? What can you journal? It was cold. It, uh, there'd been snow and then snow melting kind of on and off. Um, so imagine slushy puddles and all these sorts of things. So you're thinking like, oh, like, you know, I want, I want a flower. <laughs> it's, it's not going to happen. They're not there right now. So um, this is, I'll, I'll show you what um, we started playing with. And that ended up me drawing, well, a lot of, uh, a lot of ice. And things that ice does is really fun really fun. Uh, ice often presents these little puzzlers um, and you'll see strange ice formations and you're thinking like how if you just instead of just kind of accepting it like oh like there's this cool ice formation if you just start thinking like how on earth did that thing form ice opens up this crazy world of possible investigations um, and uh, so <laughs> Uh, Margarita, I know you don't have much ice over there right now, um, but uh, for, for folks who are in icy places, um, this is for you. But we're also going to look at some stuff with some toned paper and thinking about how do you play with your values on your toned paper. All right, here we go. And all right. Whoop. All right, now, uh, oh, we're sideways. No, we're not. Oh, now we're upside down. <laughs> That's better. Now we're talking. That's what we want. All right, so let's uh, go go up to the go up to the snow. This is how this sort of road trip unfolded. Um, I, um, I, I first sort of drove out um, um, and imagine snow on the ground. It's late evening. You're, um, I'm doing just a little bit of birding um, from the, oh, let's see. No. You'd think that after all this time, I would have my camera wrangling down. <laughs> there we are. So um, this was uh, Sandhill Cranes and all sorts of critters that were kind of out on these these ice icy fields. So it was everything was kind of covered with 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 snow with layers of ice. Everything is tones of gray. And in these sorts of, of conditions, what I encourage people to do is just to sort of start thinking about the landscape around you, just in terms of values. What's dark? What's light? Uh, in some places. Patches of water are going to be lighter than the <coughs> than the ground surface. In some cases, they're going to be darker than the ice. So it just depends on the way that the light angles are changed. So don't. There is no rule other than look at the environment around you, and you're going to kind of follow what those do. So this was before school started. 
playing with, um, you know, so here, if you look at this one here, this drawing is, so here is a little pipit and it's wandering around on the ice sheet. And there's a little bit of open water next to it. And you'll notice that the water is lighter than the ice. Back here, I had these cranes wandering around on the ice sheet. And if you look there, the um, water is darker, darker than the ice. So it really just depends on the light angle where you are, what these things are going to be doing. And so I just don't want to take that, don't want to take that for granted. So let's go to school. Um, let's start, actually, we're going to start right, where can we start? We're going to start with, ah, this is kind of a, a uh, easy, accessible place to, to, to start. So I walk out um, of the, the school at Indian Valley Elementary School and um, there ice, uh, snow has fallen during the night and then lights coming in and it's starting to melt that ice. And on the little twigs and branches in the tree in front of the school, the snow is piling up in these interesting ways. So what I've got going on here is just sort of a drawing of the twig with the snow on it. And then I've also made a little cross section. So if you notice here, here's A, A prime, right? So if you were to cut across here and look at it from the edge, this is the end view of this branch. So you can see that there's a sort of thicker zone of snow that's up here. And then it gets skinnier towards the base. And um, you might get a hint of that because um, there's a little bit more of a highlight that is up here, right? But it is kind of hard to tell like what is the, what is the cross section contour of this. That's why these these cross sections where you kind of just slice the branch and or just sort of imagine what that branch looks at like from the side. That's why those sorts of views are so useful. This one down here, take a look at it. The snow's just piled up on top of that. Isn't that cool? You know, there are these little snow uh, keels on all of the branches. And that is, that's really cool. Um, what I'm doing here is I've got a piece of toned paper, all right? So here's just a little chunk of toned paper. And I am going to draw my, 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 my branch on it. Let's see if we can zoom down more on this. There we go. So I find that my regular non-photo blue pencil doesn't really work very well on toned paper because it's so pale. So I'm just gonna use, I've got um, a um, mechanical pencil that I put some blue lead in. Um, or I could just use another colored pencil. Um, and I'm going to use this to kind of block in that I've got a branch, that there's snow that kind of comes up like this. And um, I'm using here, this is a zebra pen. The zebra pens are kind of neat pens. This, this blue one has a very sharp point. And it say here is the, the branch. And what I particularly like about the zebra pens is that if I press down on it harder, look at that, see how I get that variable line? I can make it um, harder, thicker, thinner. So you get a lot of line variation using that, using this pen just like you, if you had like a crow quill pen. And now here is the edge of the snow coming up. And I'm gonna let this line kind of be broken in some places. And 
Now it's toned paper, which gets means I get to use this. So just here is a little Prismacolor pencil on top of this thing. And it's really fun, as Volters can attest, to be able just to kind of drop in these highlights. With that pencil. And, be, and if I also bring some of this white just a little bit more bold towards the edge of this. I can, you know, you look at this and you go like, oh, that's something that's white. There's a snow on top of a little branch. Put a couple little highlights here. So there's a little bit of snow on a branch. And again, if I want to just do a cross section, you know, how is that piling up? What is the pattern that is being made? There is cross section. Hey. Another thing that you can do on um, toned paper is use white gouache. On my palette, I have a little section that is gouache land. And this white paint that's out here, that's the, the gouache. And when I um, just want to, gouache is great on toned paper. Um, but I just want to sort of show you kind of a little bit of a counterintuitive thing that happens. Um, when you first put it on, you'll say like, oh, okay, I want everybody to look at how bright this is and watch as this gets more pale over the next several seconds. As this dries, it's going to get increasingly pale. And see, it was brighter just a moment ago. You know, it was. Um, you know. So what I tend to do with, with gouache, because it does this fade as it dries, and that is really, <laughs> that's, that's irritating. Um, watch what I do here. I'm going to take the tip of my brush, and I'm just going to put it in the gouache, and I'm going to squizzle it around a little bit. And I squizzle some more, squizzle some more, squizzle some more. Oh, it's too, still too dry. I'm taking my brush. I'm drying this off. This off. Any water there. Now I'm just putting my tip of my brush back down in here. And I'm kind of cooking this up to a kind of a creamy paste. Kind of thick cream is the texture that I'm thinking. And then I come back over here. And I have a thicker application of, of the gouache. And that is going to kind of help me get sort of uh, opaque things that I want. So I can press some of this up against this leading edge here as my brush starts to run out of gouache on the tip. It gets increasingly pale. And that kind of gives me that fade. Maybe I need a little bit more white in there. Tone paper is really, really fun for, for this sort of thing. Let's go on to the uh, sort of more of the adventures that I, we're having here in the snow. Um, tracks in the snow are always really cool. There are incredible track patterns that you're going to find in the snow. Um, so you notice I've got sort of a general drawing of how these track patterns look. So there's something it's got making a tail drag. There's blood in one of its footprints. Here is a close up right here of these two footprints. Five toes. And I know it was an otter because I saw the otter go loping across the road in front of my car. Um, and there's its tail drag marks. That's pretty cool. Notice that there's measurements in here that 
from one foot on the outside to the other foot on the outside or the straddle of this critter, it's uh, 15, to centimeter, 15 to 17 centimeters. Um, and from the front toe to where that front toe appears again, um, I'm getting, notice there's a little stem leaf plot that I've got right going, going on right here. For people who are already familiar with that, um, this allows me to kind of get, uh, record a bunch of numbers. So I, I measured from the front of this toe to the front of the saint where that foot comes down at several different places in this gait pattern. And I got 63 centimeters, 66 centimeters, 66 centimeters again, and 76 centimeters. So I met, so I met one, two, three, four different times and there's a little stem leaf plot of those measurements. <clears throat> That's a fun thing to do in the snow. Um, gouache, oh, here, here we are kind of just sort of a snowbound scene. Um, this is done with gouache. Here are some swans kind of hanging out. And look at how fun that is to put um, getting to, to put the white on white toned paper. Boom. So my application here is really, it's pretty simple and straightforward. Um, what I'm doing there is that little blue pencil again. There it is. I have a sleeping swan. So I'm initially just uh, this way. Initially, I'm just blocking in sort of the, the, the general sort of shape of this swan. And then taking this zebra pen again, and this sort of nice sort of thick, thin variable line that is all kind of zebra pin. So, so here kind of going lightly and over here, kind of punch that line down a little bit harder. Maybe light variable line is much more interesting than a, my daughters and I call these zebra pens, we call them Mark pens after Mark Simmons because um, the first time I saw these pens, Mark Simmons was using one. And um, I said, whoa, that's really cool. He said, yeah, it's a zebra pen. And, and I thought to myself, wow, that's really neat. And I said, wow, I've got to go get myself one of those. And what Mark Simmons did without, did not miss a beat. Um, he just said, here, why don't you take, why don't you take and just gave me his pen out of his kit. And I was like, oh my gosh, this like this is my 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 zebra pen, like this. And now I've got this this pen just like Mark Simmons used. And so I thought to myself, oh, this is just th that's just fantastic. So I brought it home and I was doing sketching with it. My daughter Amelia came and she was looking at me draw with it. And she said, Oh, that's a cool pen. I said, Yeah, I know it's that my that Mark Simmons gave this to me. And she said, "Wow, that's 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 really really neat." And um, some days later, I was out sketching, and Mark Simmons was there, and Amelia was there. She was watching him draw. She said, like, "Wow, that's that really cool pen." And what he did is he turned to her and he said, "Here's yours." And he gave her he gave her a pen. And I just realized, like, I should have done that. And there was just that that act of just such kind of generosity, like, "Oh, you like that pen?" You just would like, like, "Here you go," and not just to me. To my daughter, and I hadn't I hadn't given mine to my daughter, and it just sort of reminded me of just the importance of kind of thinking about my generosity and like when. So now um, I carry some extra uh, uh, these zebra pens with me because whenever somebody says, "Well, that's a really cool," I remember Mark Simmons giving that pen to my daughter, and what I'll do is I'll like really. Here you go. I can give these away. I just recently gave one of these to a friend, and so uh, that, yeah, this is the Mark pen after Mark Simmons. So now check this out with this. Um, so it's generally a white bird. So I can just put white on top here. I'm putting my white in first on these upper surfaces, the ones that'll catch the most light, and then as I kind of get down this way, it's going to fade. 
and that makes the light hit the top of this swan. And so just very quickly, I can get these cool effects with, there's a little bit of brown in the heads of these, or uh, sort of warm, kind of an ochre in the heads of these swans. So I'm just gonna take a little bit of brown ochre, test it, tint this brown, <coughs> there it goes. And uh, so yeah, this uh, toned paper and gouache are really, really good friends. Let's take a look at more of this sort of icy phenomena though, because I then went to another school and was checking out what was going there. And um, this is, here's a little icicle formation. This was the metal eaves um, and the water was dripping down and then forming these icicles on the bottoms of the eaves. And it had, you know, I started looking at it, I realized like this is actually this really fascinating shape. Because look at these sort of strange kind of bumps and ridges in it. Isn't that interesting? And then I looked carefully, I could see actually water kind of moving inside or actually on the, perhaps on the outer surface, um, but I could see through it. And I could see the water coming down underneath the ice here, across, and then coming down here, and then dripping off, dripping off the edge there. So that's what that little dotted line is. So my approach here for these little icicles is is pretty straightforward. I'm looking at the icicle, and I'm roughly blocking in its 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 shape, whatever that is. Then I'm grabbing my mark pen. And as I'm looking at the icicle, my eye is just sort of tracing the edge of the icicle, kind of doing contour drawing, saying you're coming down and out a little bit. You're going to have a tendency to just go like, ur, 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 that's an icicle. But I want to look at that icicle and kind of go like, no, you kind of come down like this. And then you pooch out. And then you come down again. And I will often kind of talk out loud to my icicle, sort of say like, oh, all right, you've got a one, two bumps, and then a big bump at the end. All right. Um, and I want to kind of look for aspects of the icicle that surprise me. All right. Like what is up with how did this little ridge, this little step out form? What was going on there? Was that a point where there's wind that was blowing this way? And I don't know. But anything that you don't understand completely, those are the things that you you absolutely got to get recorded in your nature journal. Anytime there's a phenomenon that you don't really fully understand. Isn't that variable line? Just let's zoom down on that just a little bit more. Variable line of the mark pen. Mark's also going to be uh, teaching again at Wild Wonder. Um, a, a generous uh, person, not just with, with pens, but also with kind of information. I think you guys will enjoy his, his workshops. So then what I'm going to do is just take, I want this to look like not, if I take this and I draw it white, it's not going to look like ice. Ice, you're seeing through it, it you're seeing it's, it's, it's transparent. There are places that are getting highlights and sparkles. So I want to look on it. Where is it kind of kind of getting, what is the, the pattern of, of, of the highlights that are on it? And, you know, I, I find that, you know, then there, there are these sort of strange kind of inner lights in the, that you'll see inside ice. Just a little bit of that, and you kind of get this this feeling of lights hitting the ice. You don't have to make it up. You're, you're there with the icicle in front of you. Just squint at it and see what it's doing. When you squint your eyes, you're going to be able to see those lights and darks better. So just put in a few of the little highlights and it will feel icy. Ice, ice, baby. <clears throat> you see the same things going on here. 
with these little twigs that are covered with ice. There's ice inside a branch. You know, this one, there's a lot of white pencil over it, and that makes it begin to look a little bit more like it's all snowy. I think, yeah, you want, you want to keep those um, ice reflections. There are places where those are on, and then there are places where they're off. I'll show you some other, like this was the, the great ice mystery. This was this really cool ice mystery. Look at this. Check this bad boy out. This is a horizontal icicle. So that was the angle that was, it was coming, going out like this and then turned down. Like it never got the memo of you know, what it's supposed to be doing. So a little bit more about this. In cross section, it's a blade. So at point C here, it is, it's that thin. At point A here, it is bigger at the top and then has this part hold hanging down from it, All right? So wider in here. And then over here at B, it is actually at an angle here like that and then has a bottom shelf that comes down, this little, this little drip point. Um, so there's also, I've got a little kind of 3D diagram here showing the twist. And so, um, what I'm doing to, to document this, um, I've got my white pencil in here. This one actually has a, one other little thing going on with it, and I will demo that here. Um, so in rough form, my blade is coming out like this and it's hanging down. And then there are these, some of these other little drips that are on it. So here's that variable line coming down. Um, just letting that line somehow a place is kind of break is it just makes visually more more interesting. And it's got then these these little teeth that hang down like this. All right, so like what is up? What's up with that icicle? Let's first just kind of mess with this icicle a little bit more. Um, I am going to, um, if I want to make this icicle, uh, because it's such a special icicle, I'm gonna give it a little bit of extra love. Um, so I'm going to get some gray paint, test this off on the side here. Um, now, Walters, this is where I'm starting to kind of think about kind of working with values on toned paper. When you work on toned paper, um, I like to keep my value scale kind of simple. So I've got some dark here. And if I put darker watercolor on the page, there is my, that is, that's, that's, that's dark, right? My next stage in my value scale is I want to, in my drawing, have part of my drawing be, be the color of the paper itself. If I completely cover this with other colors and values, then why be doing it on this toned paper in the first place? I want to let the value of this toned paper show through. Right? And then I am going to have another step out here that is either my colored pencil or my gouache. Right, so here's a very easy three-step value scale, and um, so I've got my dark value, a medium value, and a light value. <clears throat> I can actually have one more kind of step out 
from this. I want to have a place where I can really punch in dark, dark values. I can. But this is, when I'm thinking about sort of value range on colored paper, it's probably not going to be more than this. The critical thing is going to be to have part of your drawing have that paper show through. That's what makes drawings on colored paper really work. Um, so on this, I'm going to add with this sort of medium tone, um, just a few places in this where uh, the where I'm putting in that medium tone. Um, if I want to, I can also um, do that with, with, with color. Sometimes, you know, for instance, there is, uh, this might be parts that are kind of reflecting the sky. I'm going to just get a little bit of, you know, uh, some blue into this. And that's not really showing up as blue. Can you move your oh. drawing out? Thank you. One note um, about uh, working with toned paper is sometimes when you put a stroke on it, just the water will make your page darker. And then when that dries, that goes away. Like notice this line is going away. So I've got a totally clean brush here. Look happens when I kind of put water on the page. See how that just sort of made that spot darker? I might fool myself into thinking I've put some value down there, but I really haven't. <clears throat> uh, this can also confuse you when you're making a little graded wash um, where look at this, this is going to be starting darker and then my brush starts to run out of paint, right? And you're seeing, you're seeing a dark column all the way from up here to down here, right? Um, we're going to watch this dark column dry and you think that you've made a something with value all the way to there. But already we see this part here starting to dry and it's getting paler. We're gonna just come back to that in a little bit. Meanwhile, I'm gonna add some colored pencil into this. Jack, could you also, while you're doing this, maybe say what goes through your mind when you choose to do tone paper versus white? My, my, I'll tell you, my, my, when, I am, when I'm working with a notebook like this, I'm doing everything on toned paper. Everything's toned paper. Um, and, um, and then sometimes I think to myself like, oh, actually, I'd, I kind of like to have some, some white uh, paper. Um, and, but if you have, let's say, a white paper journal, what you can do is cut out some little pieces of toned paper like this and either carry those in a little separate envelope or just tuck them into the back of your closed journal and every once in a while, and then carry a glue stick with you. Every once in a while, you pull one of these out, put some glue down, glue that into your journal and doot, 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 on top of it. Um, Wouldn't it be convenient to have a journal with both white and toned paper? You know, if only somebody were to make something like that, funny you should ask. Um, you, you, you get uh, your, your, your commission is in the mail. Um, yeah, so for the, the nature journal that um, I, I made a, a, a nature journal that kind of meets all my, my specs. Um, and this is, this is it, I like rounded corners, I like good quality paper. Um, and in that, I also have, you look at the back here, there's a section here with toned paper. And so anytime I'm thinking like, wouldn't it be fun to be able to really make 
say those rootlets on that buckeye sprout pop. I mean, those are such an interesting thing. That would be really just sort of thinking like, what would be fun to color in white? If there's any time that you're sort of thinking about like, oh, it'd be fun to kind of be able to color those in white. That means go for some toned paper. So this little uh, journal that I have, um, the one that's available on my website, um, there's a toned paper section in the back and you can tell I'm kind of getting into buckeyes and acorns and sprouting things. Um, but but past ones, let me just sort of grab some past ones. You know, you're thinking to yourself like, oh, I think I might want to draw an egret or look at those little white spots on the shoveler pop out. That's fun, right? That makes you want to um, go grab uh, go grab some toned paper. I want to play with those white spots and have them go please. Because um, I then get to add that white as as a positive shape. Like like thinking like, oh, it's swans bring, you know, show me the toned paper. Right? And look at those just sort of very simple. Just a little bit of white paint on there, one coat, and that's fun. That's fun. It's 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 physically physically enjoyable. The pleasure uh, it, it's physically pleasurable to put white paint down on a sketch with tone paper. It just it feels good. Um, so that is uh, there's there's the pitch for the journal. Um, so you can see that's just a little bit of uh, whoop, a little bit of that white pencil on there, and you kind of like, ooh, it's all sparkly. And look at that! Look at what this thing is doing now. Uh, isn't that a change? Remember that this is that this is just the effect of water. Um, not all tone papers will give you that much of a water effect. Just, just know, do a quick test to see if yours does. For instance, the tone paper in this little sketchbook, I put my water on it and there's not a big change. So this one doesn't do a big, oh, I got damp and now I'm gonna show you dark for just a little while and confuse all of your value range, right? But some types of papers do. With these um, Strathmore journals, it's, not as bad as these little sheets that I've got here for samples. Um, with, with the samples are on Canson paper, but you know, like if, if I go right there, you know, you are seeing a little bit. That's just with water, and they are getting a darkening there. But with the paper that I chose for this, um, you notice that we're not getting those aren't turning into dark brown spots, and those will disappear when it dries. So um, just kind of going back to, you know, follow the mystery, check this out. So this was that icicle and you can see when you look at it, that there's, there is a little bit of, it's not just, this one is not just um, that white colored pencil. There's a little bit of watercolor that is happening in there. Or actually that may have been just a brush pen, a Tombow brush pen. And then what I did is here's, here is a zoom out view of that icicle. There actually is this little pendulum hanging off the edge of a roof. And that then led me to kind of this hypothesized flow of how that could have formed. Where, where it started just with a straight icicle coming down. And then as the snow started to slide off the steel roof, that turned it in like that. And then with the icicle sticking off to the side, the water then ran down that and then dripped off the edge, ran down the underside of it and dripped off the edge, giving it this cross section. That was the original icicle. This is then the blade that subsequently forms on the underside of it. All right. I don't know if it's correct, but those pieces 
they do fit with that explanation, right? And that's, you know, that's some crazy fun you can have with ice. <clears throat> Um, one last thing you can do in snowy weather is to play with the patterns that snow makes when it blows into drifts. Um, what are things that, um, and, and this, what, what are the things that you see that snow does? And um, hold on a second. I'm going to find a book on my bookshelf for you folks again. Ah, I really have to get my bookshelf organized. Anyway, I can't find it. Uh, I would show you something relevant to that. Um, lovely book called um, Path Through Leaves by Hannah Henchman in which she has this, this little collection of things that snow does. And um, uh, that's a, that's a, it's a, it's a wonderful way to, to do that. Um, take a look at this and see if you can just take a moment and sort of see if you can figure out what am I exploring here on this page? What is going on here? What's on, what's on my think about, see if you can figure out what I'm doing, what I'm geeking out on and why I am, any decisions that I made on, on how to record that information. So um, I'm looking at snow on a steel roof. And as the sun comes out, it warms the roof. And these um, strips of snow start to slide down between the slats in the steel roof. And as they come off the edge, they make these pendulums that curl down around the edge. Whoop, whoop. And <clears throat> this is a kind of um, a diagram of what is is then going on with this. Um, and notice I've got it, you know, here's the north side, the south side, the east side, and the west side. So on the north side, in the northern hemisphere, facing away from the sun, the roof is, here's a diagram from the top to the bottom of the uh, snow on the roof. So it's a snowy roof. On the south side, from the top to the bottom, it's all melted snow, because that's the side that the sun is on. And then the east and the west side get kind of glancing light. This is what's going on on the east side. This is what's going on on the west side. Uh, we have these the snow sliding out between these little slats. Um, so as snow starts to melt in your area, there's going to be all sorts of crazy things that are going on with um, the physics and thermodynamics of the melting snow and the substrate that it's on. Um, you know, you look at snow melting on the hood of a car, car warmed up, um, you can see where heat is being transferred through. If you look at the roof of a badly insulated house, you can spot the parts of the house that have poor insulation on it by how the snow melts on that surface. Um, so the, um, yes, uh, trail through leaves um, is, is the, uh, um, I think that's the, 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 the Hannah Henchman book. Um, the, um, So this is um, just, this is something that you can have just a ton of fun with. You know, this is different than drawing, I want to draw the snow scene with the snowy hills and the, the pine trees covered with snow in them. This is, you're out and you're kind of just geeking out, you're looking for phenomena. Um, and the, 
and melting snow and and accumulating snow you know the world is just filled with these crazy cool phenomena like look at this phenomena here these are um, blades of grass and a pine needle and they were covered in these blobbies of ice and they are in the drip line of Indian Valley Elementary School by the edge of the roof. And as you go out away from where the water splashes down, these things get higher and then you get into the snow. So there's this zone of what the kids and I were calling the reverse sickles. Um, and I mean, what a fun phenomenon. What a fun phenomenon. You can see in there just a little bit of um, a little bit of value put in um, with some watercolor, or maybe that was just a pale gray Tombow pen. And then the rest of this is just coming along with that white Prismacolor pencil and going and variable, variable with the mark pen. Um, we have a question about when to use um, the white gel pen versus when to use the white pencil. Um, the white gel pen, I think, would be um, would be a little bit too um, too thin and skinny for that for that. So I wouldn't use gel pen on this. I would go for that white Prismacolor pencil. I um, also just want to sort of show you. Um, back kind of to this guy. Another great tool, kind of easy, press the easy button for your tools when you're working on toned paper, something like this. This is a Tombow brush pen, right? The Tombow brush pen is, uh, has a brush tip on one side and on the other side, it has a little fine drawing tip. And what I find is that if you get, let's say you're working on gray toned paper, I will get the two most pale gray Tombow brush pens. And that allows me to, you know, I could just come along with something like this. And it just puts a little bit of a hint of value in it. Look at this here. It's, it's a very pale pen, but if I put down one stroke, I can then make that darker by putting another stroke so I can build up by putting several strokes. So you notice how this is now a fade from darker to lighter. That's just several strokes with that Tombow brush pen. And um, so that is, that's a really lovely tool for working on the tone paper. Similarly, um, when I'm working on brown tone paper, I might get the two lightest brown Tombow brush pens. And you see here on these elephants, I've done a quick gesture sketch with the Tombow and then come along with the mark pen on top of that. Um, let's see if there's any more where that is, we're using that approach. I oh, hear yeah, a bunch of, here are some elephants. And so first just kind of blocking it in lightly with that Tombow and then coming over that with, um, with a darker pen. Here you can see a wildebeest that was blocked in and then it moved before I finished it. Here was a zebra that I blocked in with that brush pen. I like the brown one on the brown tone paper and the gray one on the gray tone paper. Look, I never, never finished my zebra, but just got some nice zebra body, body moments going on there. Um, here you can see this hippo moment. Let's zoom down on hippo land. So, that there's just kind of putting that in lightly with that Tombow 
gives me my basic shape and then I can get in there and draw that was with a ballpoint pen on top of that. Here was a leopard hanging out in a tree. And when you look at this, you're kind of like, oh, there's no Tombow behind that because our eyes just go straight to that mark pen line. But no, that drawing started with, that started with a kind of Tombow that kind of blocked in that basic shape for me. Let's see, where is more? Uh, this was uh, going to a museum exhibit about Pompeii. Um, and they actually had um, the casts of some of the people who didn't make it through that. Um, it was a very moving um, museum exhibit. Um, this, underneath this Smilodon head here, you can see that started with this, you see some Tombow brush pen coming off here. There's Tombow behind this whole thing. And that allowed me to kind of block that, that lock that in. And then the eclipse happened. Oh my gosh, look at that. <laughs> oh, how can that happen? Oh, but then the sun came back. I was so, so worried that big snake up there would swallow the whole thing, but it came back. It was okay. Um, so there are a few thoughts and ideas. Um, about um, drawing ice and snow, working a little bit, um, uh, working a, a little bit with the uh, with that toned paper. That idea again, critical with the toned paper, is that we gotta let that color of the toned paper shine through. Um, if it's um, oh, this is fun. I, I just uh, found a page where I was sketch noting um, a Mark Simmons class. <laughs> I love that guy. Um, the uh, um, so let me see. Um, yeah, you when you're working on toned paper, the idea is that in some places in that the color of the paper is showing through, and that is a big part of what is going to it'll make that page that, that drawing feel like it fits on that page. If I've got, if everything is, um, if everything is covered with other values, then again, like, why are we using the tone paper? You know, we, um, we had to build up those other colors and values anyway. I hope there is some fun strategies in here, and I hope that anybody who's out there now in an ice storm in a place or at a place where the snow around you is starting to melt, you can get out there and have some fun with those phenomena. Again, the, the I, I tried to find it on my bookshelf, but there's another book that I have. It's this old, old book. It's this strange little book of photographs of melting snow, and the book is called Snow Stumpers. And it's somewhere on, somewhere on that bookshelf over there, right? One of those. Um, and so, and what it was is they would show you sort of snow melting in a weird way. And then it was up to you to figure out like, oh, this is because that had been compacted by a bicycle running over it. And that part over there hadn't. Um, or somebody walked across this snow and then the stuff where the footprints didn't come down, um, those um, those melted first, or that there's insulation on this. So you, there'd be all these kind of puzzles. And that kind of got me just kind of going into like realizing that, that snow, um, um, a, a, you know, snow does all sorts of cool, crazy things. Um, oh, there's a safety um, note here from um, Ad Chadwick of uh, Point Blue Conservation Science who says, um, yeah, but do be careful around the eaves of buildings. Um, if you're out there kind of playing with um, icicles and, and snow, where that snow kind of slides off, um, that might not end up well for you. Um, so do be safe doing this, but have some crazy fun with, um, with melting snow and, um, and, and piles of snow. Um, if you find ice, 
um, just realize that, that just like like geek out in like what what's what's going on here in, in sort of physics and thermodynamics and what kinds of patterns what kind of conditions are going to make this um, and any like icicle that's like changed its position there's a little bit of the history of its formation gets cooked into, maybe that's the wrong metaphor when you're talking about icicles, but gets, um, gets kind of uh, locked into the structure of this icicle. So it tells this history of its own formation. That's just, that's amazing. That's crazy. Um, if you're in a place with no ice, no icicles, no snow, you haven't seen that in centuries. Um, uh, perhaps there are phenomena with heat in your area um, that you can play with. Um, big picture here is that the world around us is filled with mysteries. The world around, the world around is filled with stuff that when we look a little bit closer, we realize, I have no clue what's going on there. And these, for us nature journalers, are places where we lean in. And we kind of like, oh, goody, something that I don't understand, right? When you get those little gifts from the universe of here's a phenomenon that I don't understand. And with even the stuff that you do understand, you start looking a little bit closer, a little bit closer, a little bit closer, you'll be able to kind of, you know, pull back the curtain to you know, the point where like, I understand this point of rainbow formation. And so I'm not going to just go like, yeah, I get rainbows, got rainbows, no problem. Right. But you keep looking at it and then you're going, yeah, but why that? And why that? Right. So like I may be able to understand that little reflection, refraction diagram that we've seen in the physics book of like what happens when the light goes through the rainbow, uh, ref refracts, reflects off the backside and then refracts again as it's coming down towards you, changes its direction two times in that little journey. Okay, I can understand that as a diagram, but do I understand that when I'm looking at a rainbow, why is the value of the sky different on the inside of the rainbow versus the outside of the rainbow or between a double rainbow band, right? What's up with that little dark zone that's between the double rainbow, right? And you just start looking around at the world and you realize like, I don't under like 99.9999999 extend the nines of percent of the stuff that could possibly be understood by humans is not understood by humans, right? Um, and so the, there's, the world is ripe with phenomena that are, are, are out there for all of us who have wonder in our eyes and in our hearts. So let that be you. And your challenge for um, this week is to try to find a phenomena that you don't really understand and to play with it. And I hope that that is a ton of fun for you. Um, I'm going to be in a few minutes actually posting a video on the Nature Journal Connection that will be all about how do you use inference as a tool to help you figure out phenomena that you don't understand. And um, that uh, for people who want to really like geek out on like what does inference really look like, um, that I think that should be fun for you. Um, want to invite everybody to check that, check that. It'll be posted within an hour. All right, my friends, thank you so much for being here. Let's turn it over now to the Nature Journal Club Community Cam. And um, if you don't want your uh, image to be shown, turn off your camera right now. And um, But if you are willing to let us see your face, it's so much fun to see the faces of all the, um, the, uh, the our, our, our friends out here. And anybody who's got questions or comments or wants to share a journal page, you just hold those up to the screen. We'll see you. Um, or you can just wave at us if you just got a, a, a comment. You can also use that, use that hand on, uh, on the, the system here, and uh, we will find you. Um, and let's go there now. I'm going to start with Janice Doppler. Um, we're going to, in just a moment, we're going to allow you to unmute yourself. Um, Brian, could you take point on that so that we're not all doing it simultaneously? Um, and um, I'm going to add Janice here in on my spotlight. Oh, you've been looking at wild turkeys. This is fun. Just a moment. Uh, you should be. Oh, there you go. So there we go. So I've had turkeys hanging out in my yard. So 
one of the, I started a few pages, and so one of them, I I got a picture of the the prop the property line, and every time the turkeys come, I I look at where they were, and I use a different color, and I map out where they went, so that over time I can see where the turkeys have their favorite pattern places to go. Oh, this is brilliant! And are you keeping the track of those dates? Uh, yeah, they're yeah. Those are dated. Okay, see, this is, I mean, everybody take a look at this in terms of visual thinking, like Brian Higginbotham has been talking a lot about in his classes about visual thinking, thinking with pictures. And when you see this, right, a number of people say like, oh, of course, this is so obvious. This is like the right way to document this, right? No, this is a way that Janice made up that is really appropriate for this. And doing this investigation this way with these phenomena she is going to notice things that she otherwise would not have seen because she is mapping it out and diagramming it in this way. This is awesome. This is, I, I, I love the way your brain is working on this. But so everybody, then, think about how you can multi, multi you take this uh, sort of system that Janice has got here, how can you apply that to other phenomena that you are seeing? And let's see what else is going on there. So then I just did did my best to draw a turkey and get some of the main parts of main things like the, the, the hump and then how it holds its body still and different different head angles, but the body stays still. So I, I did that and then well actually before you before you go on to that, just go back to those turkeys for one more moment. Everybody look down there on that bottom there um, and notice like the hydra turkey. So there's one body and multiple heads. Right? This is a really great strategy for sort of saving time when you are doing quick sketching out in the field. What are these? You're going to have that one, that one body, and then you drop all those different heads around it. Each one is doing different sorts of things. You've got the walking, resting, and feeding positions. That's really cool. And are these coming up on, on my side? All the writing looks back. Oh, I, I know. But fortunately, for the rest of us, on your own okay. screen, your screen looks reversed. On everybody else's screen, it looks great. So we can see okay, it. Good. That's right. So then I want to get more details about what was going on. If I can. So on these two pages, I've done that. And what I did on over on this page, I have on this date, this is what happened and some pictures of it. The turkeys got scared by the dogs next door and they, they flew up on the roof of my house. And so I wrote about that and and there was a day when they were under, actually the same day, I think, they were under the bird feeders. And um, one of the things that I noticed was the turkeys actually do this moonwalk kind of thing where they, they reach out with one foot, they, these were in the snow under the bird feeder, and they reach out with one foot and pull it back and then reach out and then with the other foot, they pull it back and pull it back and it and it looks just like they're moonwalking it's really and so i so i wrote down what that process is and then i love that you call it moonwalk uh, yeah. that is so that's perfect yeah it's really that's what cool. it looked like and then as i watched i recorded a lot of details and it raised some questions like i wanted to know how could i tell if it was males or females so I looked up that male turkeys, the breast feathers look like this and the female feathers are colored like this. And I read about a way to tell if they're males or not. Another way is they get this um, spur and you can tell by the spur. So I have details about the spur and um, how that develops. And so I know that my two turkeys um, are both males that are more than two years old. And then just some some other other details. Oh, there were some inter interactions with with other birds, with cars, with each other, um, and, and and that sort of thing. So that I so that I've captured details of what I observed as well as what happened each time. And then there's there's another 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 couple of pages because they've come back. One morning I woke up and they were they were in the tree. There's a there's a line of arborvitae that are deer browsed and the turkeys were sitting up in the in the tree branches and so i watched what they did that that day so i'm recording that sort of thing too 
everybody noticed a couple of things. First of all, doesn't this make you want to play with tone paper? Yeah. And the um, a, another is notice that Janice has a project. She's gotten curious about the turkeys. I got curious about the ice. She got curious about the turkeys. Now every morning when she walks, gets up, she sees anything, anything going with the turkeys. She's grabbing her journal because seeing the turkeys is now a stimulus for her to grab her journal and start journaling. So if you get a project going on in your own, uh, in your own house, um, so that can be, you know, if you've got a plant and you're watching it sprout, you know, I've got these buckeye plants that I'm, I'm, I'm now trying to sprout. And, you know, whenever I see they're doing something different, oh, I grab my journal. So Janice sees turkeys, she grabs her journal. Get yourself, if you're thinking like, like, I wish I was just journaling more, get yourself a project like Janice has going on here. And that project will direct you to starting to um, journal on a more regular basis. Like I'm guessing like when those turkeys show up, Janice, you can't help yourself but grabbing your journal. Yeah, yeah, yeah. whatever I'm doing. And I, I think they're here more than I, than I know because one day I was eating breakfast and, I, and, and a, a big blob went past the window and I thought, oh my gosh, that must be a turkey. And I put my breakfast down and I went and the turkeys, the turkeys were there and they were, they were here and gone in 10 minutes. But if I hadn't seen them fly past the window, I would have missed them that day. So I think they're here more than I see. And, and, and also, but again, everybody knows that it's because Janice had this project going on, putting the journal, the turkeys in her journal makes her more curious about the turkeys. Mm -hmm. Then she sees that little darkness outside the window. And instead of like, for a lot of us, if you weren't doing a, a turkey project, you're kind of like, oh, turkeys, right? And, but she's like, oh, turkeys. Now then she knows that there's gonna be something interesting going on there. And then she goes and she checks it out. And because she's paying attention rigorously, she's rewarded then by them now showing her a new phenomenon about turkeys that she hasn't seen before. Here's how they hang on these branches. And here's the cross section, how they balance on top of that. You know, each time, each of these new kind of turkey moments is going to kind of up the ante and you keep kind of following the project, you keep getting positive reinforcement from it. You get dopamine every time you see a new cool turkey moment. Yeah, and just the last thing, just to, to, to um, illustrate that point about you, you, you get curious and you see things you wouldn't see. One day, I, the turkeys were hanging out and I kept looking at them and I couldn't spend hours watching that day, but I went, I just, I glanced out just to see what was happening and there were two ravens in my yard on the snow and mm -hmm. turkeys and the ravens and the turkeys were interacting. I, I hardly, uh, up until this year, I, you know, turkeys once a year, twice a year, ravens once every few years and here there were two, two of each. And I wouldn't have noticed that if I hadn't been paying attention to the turkeys. Yeah, and you just, you just gotta gobble up these experiences as they come. <laughs> Oh man, that's really fun. Yeah, I'm a big fan of turkeys. Um, and, and thank you so much for, for showing those. And just you know, so many lessons that we can apply to our own nature journaling that I saw in, in those pages. Um, now, um, if you would like, um, hold your um, hold your your journal up to the screen. Um, and we will bounce over to you. Uh, Tracy, um, let's, uh, Tracy Sigers, I'm going to go to your screen and welcome. Hi, I, um, I had my birthday and I went to a place where I was technology, but my did not sync up with my phone and I could, I had no video internet while I was there. So I felt kind of bad because I was going to talk about going to the beach and doing a cleanup, but I couldn't reach you guys. Oh. Uh, so while I was away in Florida, I got to see a dolphin breach seven oh. or eight times very close to our boat, pretty close to our boat. I have internal that, came back, saw my in-laws. They had wolves in their backyard. Oh. Um, okay, I'm about to go visit your in-laws. Yeah, 
And I know that's breaking some COVID proto protocols, but <laughs> let them know that I'm coming over this afternoon. Well, if, if you've been keeping good with your COVID stuff, they'll probably welcome you, so. <laughs> oh, man, um, look, that's so cool. And then you've been sketching from those? Um, I just started, like I've been overwhelmed just watching, looking at the pictures and um, manipulating them to move. Let me get that reflection out of there for you. Uh, they killed a deer that morning and uh, it was carnage. I mean, pink snow everywhere, but there were five of them and they came back and they fed on it at different points in the day and all together. Like, I just, like, I feel like, like angels visited me basically <laughs> in the form of wolves. That's um, so cool. Yeah. And I think that they are like a little detached pod that came, got pushed down. There's a big creek bed and stuff through there. But I mean, that got, like a guy used to live on this land not too long ago, I mean, seven or eight years ago, and he just hasn't sold it or done anything with it. So I think it's been filling up with deer. And um, these guys are chubby. I, I, I observed them cleaning themselves in the snow when they had blood on them. Wow. Oh, what an amazing, amazing sight. I yeah. have like a video of like, just, I mean, I can play it off of here. Where like four wolves move around. Like, I'm just so like stunned. I'm like, don't even know where to journal. Um, I got a video where the wolves are. Um, if you uh, post any of those up, uh, I want to just please link that over to the Nature Journal Club Facebook page. I think it'd be a okay. bunch of people who would love to sketch wolves from your, uh, from the, the references you take. Yeah, I'll put them up. That'd so. be great. That's yeah, so I'm just going through and I'm just starting with poses because I'm like, we talked about poses on the conservation wolf video when we watched that the live video, but I was like, oh, it's too fast. I didn't get it. Like here, I'm like, oh, look at him walk. I think they disappear in the trees. It's like yes. you see them and then you don't see them and then you see them and you're like, how did you do that? <laughs> um, oh, so I'll, I'll have that. I'll put that up later today. Excellent. Um, and also, I want to wish you a, a, a happy birthday. So you did the, um, the, the, the birthday clean, clean. Yes, I did um, Sanibel Island. All right. in, um, um, I, I want to, to bring Avea here um, as um, who is the, uh, our, the, our, the person who got us started in the Nature Journal Club. Um, doing cleanups, uh, beach cleanups, and, and um, on our birthdays. Um, and um, I thought you might have some comments or, or, or thoughts to share. That just makes me so happy. Thank you so much for, for loving and taking care of Sanibel Island and doing that stewardship. And on your, like, how did it feel? Um, it felt really connected to everything. Like the world was celebrating with me. So... Yeah, I don't know. Also, there's something about like feet in the sand on your birthday that like is very kind of primal. Yes. So, that is although awesome. I was born in the winter in Wisconsin, so I don't think my feet hit natural ground till the spring. <laughs> that is so awesome. Just yeah. being able to, to, to be part of that and just thank you for what you do. Thank you. Thank you for inspiring doing. So for people who are just sort of coming in on the, the uh, we're privy to our the previous conversations about this, um, every year on our birthday, a band goes out and does a beach cleanup. And um, that's prompted a number of us in the nature journal community to take up the same practice, a way of um, an act of service on, um, on your birthday. And one that connects you with the earth. Um, and, um, and so, Vea, thank you so much for starting that ball rolling. rolling. Um, Tracy, um, just so delighted that um, you that you uh, that, that you, you did that and and showed up for this planet. Right. So, you know, and it was surprisingly not bad. It was this long causeway, and I was really surprised. It was not as like it made me hopeful for people because it wasn't as bad as I thought it could be. That is good news. That's the kind of, that. that's definitely, I would say that's the sort of thing that goes in the journal too, because when you find that something's better than you hoped, that you want to hold on to. 
you want to hold on to those kinds of moments. Also to add, if anybody else does like the, a birthday act of stewardship, tell the rest of us so we can celebrate with you and do something as well so that we can honor your, your day as well by doing something in our communities as well for you while thinking of you, okay? Thank you. Um, so let me see, I am, now let's jump back to, I'm gonna go to my gallery view. Um, if there's anybody else that would like to share something with us, oh, uh, Ray Bonto, it's good to see you again. We've got another great example here of working on toned paper um, uh, from Ray Bonto. Um, hey there. I have no toned gray, and unfortunately, you need to think about that, personally. <laughs> uh, and I, um, but I've got a toned tan and brown. So I decided to sketch with that. Oh, good, good, good. Okay, good, good. Yep, isn't it? It's, it's fun to see the. That that the, the way you're you you let the white fade into the color of the paper really feels like shadows on that clump of snow. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. Great. Well, have have fun with this. Thank you so much for for sharing that. And oh. um, I was tan, so my value goes with brown to black. Mm -hmm. oh, great. And I decided to just do some quick gestures before the class of a complete page of words. Oh, wow. This is good. There's that Hoffinch. This is exciting. And uh, is that, that one with the red on the face, is that your European goldfinch? Um, but, um, yeah, the bo bottom. Uh, yeah, that's a goldfinch. Yeah, we don't have any red on our goldfinches out here. That's, that's a really fun bird. Um, I love this page filled with bird studies. You know, this is the best way people are wondering like how do I learn how to understand how to manage my watercolors um, that you're looking at it right here is, is there anything else that you felt like showing us yeah I also decided to sketch and I think it's an Egyptian like jar and a red Next, my jaw uh, with a zebra pen. Oh man, this is well, this is really exciting. And what are you using for uh, to create those values? A zebra pen and a brush because uh, to a brush because it's water soluble. Oh, what outstanding value studies! This is really exciting to see. In addition to those, those solid values, you sort of built up to complex patterns without losing the structure of the birds. The birds still have their integrity of their feather, feather groups and a solidity to them in addition to having a lot of information um, about the, the details of those patterns. That's really fun to see. Thank you. Thank you. I also decided to with an HP pencil. You know that other one um, that it's in John Bosby's book. You, you know this painting, don't you? You've seen it there, haven't you? Oh, yes, yes, yes. Uh, yeah, so I decided to sketch it in HP. Uh, that's really fun. Yeah, um, you learn so much by copying the strategies and techniques of, of other people. Um, 
And then when you come away from doing an exercise like this, it just puts all sorts of new things in your bag of tricks. Oh, great. Um, I, I thought of a new um, way. You don't need fixative. I, I just thought of drawing on separate cardstock and putting the whole thing with tape. And then it it will only rub the tape. That's a great idea. <laughs> Oh, and you're using that big wide packing tape. That's that's really smart. I've never thought of doing that. Yeah. Thank you. Hey, thank you, Ray Bonto. It's really good to see you again. All right, let me now go to my gallery view. Um, uh, Nicholas, uh, we're going to jump over to you. Hello, everyone. Hi thank there. you for, uh, for this. Yeah, thank you. And uh, talking about snow, we had our another very big storm here, and it was very fun to to watch. So uh, my son William didn't have school today because of that, and uh, I enjoy time drawing with all of you. And then he yeah, had some fun playing with the tone paper. And uh, good. I think he wanted to show you everyone. Oh, there we go. There we go. Yeah, that it's it's wonderful just how, you know, a little bit of value pops things really pop on toned paper like this. And then um, maybe a question also about these values. It's that, uh, for instance, uh, if you want to, uh, for example, do a bird that moves ahead, but still you keep the same body uh, as we saw earlier which was very fun, but you want to capture some of the change of light, lighting or change of snow patterns on the, or reflection on, on that. Um, but then there's uh, maybe some issue with uh, too much uh, values in it or too much water coming into it. So how do you fix that? Or how do you, um, uh, yeah, how, how can you secure your first drawings without uh, really inhibiting your own creation for the next one? Yeah, you're absolutely right. There's a, a, a point of diminishing returns on that, where um, if you, uh, you keep, if, if you keep adding layers of information on top of this one drawing, um, you start losing some information that you had already put in there. Um, what I recommend doing is, is um, in some drawings, I will have like multiple heads on one critter. Um, and then um, also just start to have multiple drawings on the same page. So you don't have to flip the page, just you know, right there, kind of Ray Bonto style, you know, put in another drawing, put in another drawing, put in another drawing. This one slightly overlaps, this one, this one slightly overlaps, this one, that's okay. Um, when I finally kind of get to the point where like I'm, I'm, I'm losing information because of my overlap, then flip over to another page, but you get these pages that are just dense and filled with, um, filled with, 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 with data and information. Let me see if I can find, um, yeah, let me just, uh, I'm going to jump over to my little cam here again. And just show you some examples of sort of you know multiple drawings on on on, on one page. Um, so here are, you know quick studies of the of a dipper um, and and its nest. These are kind of multiple studies of you know these are birds that are moving around. They start the osprey and um, and then it then it moves. So I can now start another drawing over here. So, you know, I started this drawing on the nest here. This is kind of, uh, this is a nest that's out on a little island. Um, and I started drawing the bird and then it moves looking over to the right. So I just started drawing that to the right of it a little bit larger. And then I just put that in an inset circle, with a little arrow pointing over to that. And it looks like that was all planned and intentional. Like that was my strategy all along. Now I'm going to do a little enlargement and you know, show you what that head looks like. But no, that was 
I was just drawing this one and then it moved, looked over to the side. So I just started drawing that. Oh, it's a little bit bigger. Well, let's pretend that like that was, I have to put that in a circle. Here's the magnified view of that. Here's, and then I used that same technique over here. I drew a little circle around this and drew an arrow up to that way to say like this, this here is the magnified view of this. This here is the magnified view of that. Um, it's an amazing idea. Yeah, I like it a lot. Yeah. Um, is the diaper carrying uh, the dipper carrying like uh, the the remains of some of the of the the young this is, on the nest? Yeah, this is the fecal sac. So birds that will make um, nests often don't want all the poop in piles around their nesting site. So when they fly, you'll see them fly into the nest with a little insect in its bill, and then when they come out of the nest, very often they're holding a little little white bag and it's kind of like disposable diapers that you can fold up and it makes this little sack and it's got all the baby poop on the inside and it's like the little you know it's you know hard on the outside and and and, and soft on the inside and but it's you can pick it up with your hands and you don't get you know poo hand the fecal sack works the same way they don't want to soil the nest in there so when the chicks are in there the chicks poop out a little fecal sac. And then the adult picks it up in its beak, flies off, and drops that off someplace in the woods. Otherwise, you'd be able just to, by smell, be able to figure out where the bird nests are because there'd be these big piles of poo around there and the predators would, would find them. Um, and here's another kind of example of kind of bouncing around different drawings. Here you see what we kind of had an idea earlier Right, here's multiple tails on one bird. And then here's, here's, a, here's another view. Here's another view here. So sometimes I'll put them attached to the critter. Sometimes they drop down on their own. Uh, here's multiple little uh, like some of these uh, birds I'm looking at, there's a lot of red on the head, others a little less, others even less. None of these have to be finished. Um, drawings can bump into each other, overlap, um, and uh, let's see if there's any other very kind of furry pages that have lots of these. Yeah, here's. So here is a, uh, this is exactly the sort of the scenario that you're, you're talking about. Um, um, here is, here's a bird on a branch and it's moving its tail side to side. So here's um, the original tail position and then as it sits there, it pulls its tail in. Um, then it settles down into this new position more so that the angles of the wings on the back have changed enough that I then decided to draw a second version of that bird in this new, slightly new position. And as it's sitting there, sometimes it turns its head sideways to me. I work on this drawing. Sometimes it's got its head turned away from me and it's looking in different directions. So I've got these multiple heads. I could have put them down here on top of that, but then they would get a little bit too you know, here I decided that if I put those all together on the same thing, it would just be a little bit too visually confusing. But you can see the same ideas of kind of moving around multiple views of the same thing. Here is a couple of head views. Here's the side view. Here's the original back. Here's back number two. Where you got back? Um, let's see if there's more. Sort of show kind of overlapping, overlapping birdie views. Uh, um, sometimes a new drawing is is the is the right approach. Um, this perhaps could have been done with all one drawing. Um, this was a strange cowbird display, a bronze cowbird. It puffs up its feathers and its back. So from the front, you kind of get this 
crazy effect, this sort of hood face that pops up. Um, and, but this one I decided to, it would be best for two drawings to kind of show that. I could have drawn one and then shown the outline of how those feathers popped up. That also would have worked in that condition. Oh, here's, here's multiple heads on one bird. So, yeah, this, this is, yeah, this directly answers your question. So I'm starting with this view of this woodpecker from behind, and then it's moving its head from side to side. So I'm just getting these quick little things in there to get those other angles. And then it tilts its head up a little bit more so that I'm seeing more of the top of its head. And when it does that, that's why I decided to do a new drawing of that, because if I put it in, a, in here, that would just, that would, I would lose data, I would lose information. But you can see I'm, I am showing kind of multiple views and uh, I'm getting those on. Multiple views can also just be done with different birds. Did that address your question? Yes, uh, thank you so much. It like, gives me a lot of ideas. And then I was always like, okay, if I have already set up the details and everything is, uh, is well done, should I do an, a new one or just alter the, the one I had already before? So it's a kind of uh, a loose seconds thinking what to do instead of uh, seeing and drawing. Mm -hmm. That's right. And the more that and there is no rule to it, um, whatever kind of keeps you keeps you observing, connecting, observing, All right? So here's multiple head views. If you ever find yourself kind of waiting for the bird to come back to that, that drawing that you were doing before so that you could continue your drawing, just start a new drawing or whatever that position is. If you want it to come back to this position, start drawing this and then we'll come back to that. Um, otherwise they can somehow tell you're waiting for them to come back to that position and they they uh they can start to do it then. um let's see here i'm going to jump back to this cam there um let's ah botany fun Yes. Um, first of all, I wanted to say a major shout out to, to your advice about how if you have to teach it yourself, then that's what really teaches you the thing that you're trying to learn. Um, so I um, was trying to do different diagrams of the families instead of just finding a diagram that was already online or whatever. I thought it would be more helpful if I did it myself, um, not only to learn it, but then also so I could highlight the parts that I thought were important. So I was doing this with the first family that we did, which was Rosaceae. Um, and then one thing I like about nature journaling is that it's made me more willing to, to, if I have a hard time drawing something, then that's okay. And I don't, I don't give myself as hard of a time. So it took me a few tries to be able to draw brassicaceae, um, a certain flower of it, because there's so much going on inside of them. So it was fun trying to figure out how to put it together, um, and to look at them. And, and then it gives me lots of time to think about, you know, other things I'm going to try to do. And then this one is going to be for later. I'm not going to say which week it's going to be but i was trying to figure out this family which is the bee family oh boy because there are um if you've ever heard me go on one of my botany rants you'll you'll hear that um there's been musical plants played a lot and so because of some genetic testing and whatnot then there are some families that have now been combined that were used that were previously taught as being separate and then others where like i think that it was what was it was it Scrofulariaceae that lost a ton of its species to Plantagenaceae, and it makes me think that Lamiales is really confused. Anyways, so there's like three or four, and who knows how many um, families that got combined under Fabaceae. Um, so I'm writing down like all of my questions. Also, because I'm curious about nature patterns, I'm making myself a list here, and I'm going to see like if I notice any of the patterns appearing in the family, I'm going to check them off. Um, I think I see the spirals like within some of the tendrils. So that's a fun idea. I was trying to figure out how the flowers have in common because acacia flowers do not look like pea flowers. 
and yet they are now the same family. Um, and then I was trying to figure out C. salpinaceae or C. salpinoidae, I rather should say, because I didn't understand the difference between that and I wasn't paying enough attention in botany. So I was <laughs> drawing it. And then I realized it reminded me of Daisy Duck for some weird reason, I have no idea why. <laughs> <laughs> and so I was drawing that because then I was reading that in one of them, the banner is inside of the wings and the other one, it's outside of the wings. And if that makes no sense, don't worry. It's not supposed to make sense. <laughs> and then I was drawing um, a rosemary flower to see how that would be different from Favaceae. I mean, I already know that they're different, but sometimes when I just look at them, I'm like, why do you look so similar? So, yeah. Lamiales or Lamiaceae, I'm sorry. This is a mint family member. And this is a pea flower member, and different and different kinds of leaves. Because... Oh wow! Yeah, and so people, if you want to 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 learn more about this and see like what is what is up with this, um, so Ivea is taking us sort of step by step, family by family, starting with the the ones that you kind of commonly eat and ones that you have um, you've got a personal relationship with these plant families already. And um, so you can join up with her classes and it's a chance to sort of both do some uh, nature journaling, some diagramming, some hanging out with people and learning some uh, journaling strategies as well as um, it's gonna help us, you know, get our, our, our botany under our hat. Um, that's fantastic. Thank you. So, so yeah, it, 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 the idea is just to get used to how to look for patterns within the plants. And so you don't have to know, <clears throat> pardon, you don't have to know all the plant families in the world. I'm, I think I read somewhere that there's somewhere like four or 500. Who knows? I don't think everybody knows all of the ones. And I don't even want to think about how many millions of species there might be in the world. You don't have to know every single one. I don't. What makes a person a botanist isn't knowing everything. It's getting excited about the plants when you see them and and getting excited about not knowing everything so please show me a plant i don't know it makes me happy also one quick thing some really happy news so you know with the whole napkin thing where you have like maybe only a little bit of paper and then you just write down a ton of notes i didn't really have time to break in my new journal um but i got allowed to go back for the first time in 11 months to my restoration site so this was my initial walk through with my supervisor where I just wrote down a bunch of crazy notes and sort of sketched what the map is supposed to look like. And this morning I started sketching a more official. Oh, fun, 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 fun. So I finally, and I'm gonna try to keep a nature journal of my restoration uh, work. So I'm thinking about how to best do this. Next time I'm there, I'm planning to diagram out um, <laughs> Cape Ivy, my nemesis. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. Uh, what's going to happen is through that active attention, you're going to also learn to respect it and love it in a different way too. I, it's true. There was a time when uh, like maybe a year ago or so I was growling at it like I often do. And then I noticed that it was flowering and I smelled the flowers. And if you don't know, they're related to sunflowers. So they, they're, they're lovely composite flowers and it smelled so sweet. Oh. And that's compared to the smell of the leaves. I mean, it's called Delaria odorata because the leaves have a very strong kind of dizzy making smell, but the flowers smelled like honey. And I was looking at it, I'm like, okay, you're cute. I, admit. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> I have respect for that plant. That's so cool. Yeah, so um, Avea is a, a, as, uh, is a steward of a portion of the Golden Gate uh, National Recreation Area and regularly shows up to tend and take care um, of our of our, our 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 flowering friends out there and all of their associates. So thank you again for the the work which you're doing on behalf of of, of conservation stewardship and and education in this community. You've really stepped up and, and connected us. Thank you, thank you so much for giving me the tools. Oh goodness me, sorry. <laughs> um, let me see here. I am going to jump over to our gallery view again. Um, uh, Chris, did you want to share that page? No, no. I saw that the journal held up there, but you you, you are muted. Uh, you are muted. I was just looking back at my organization and realizing I really need indexes. I've now completed four journals. I just finished one, and I can't find anything. <laughs> Yeah. Um, then what's the, you know uh, fast forward, and you're going to have a uh, 
uh, uh, shelves filled with these journals. Yeah. And and then it um, it, it it gets uh, it gets confusing. Right. Right. And you want to to find that one? I'll show you. Um, in, Second, let me uh, just grab a book off my shelf here. So, um in the little journals that, that I printed in the back of it, I made these little um, index pages. Right. And so those are, are, are fun because you can you can kind of look down at them and and sort of and sort of see like, oh, um, when I was drawing um, uh, um, uh, Carolyn's panda bear, that is maybe on page 50 and I can go over to page 50. Oh, look, there's panda. Um, <laughs> I Pictographs, the little pictures you put in the index. Yeah. That's a good idea. Yeah. So yeah, you can you you can make it a kind of a visual index, right? Of the the, the sorts of things that you're that you're seeing there. Um, you can also draw on the outside of the books, kind of some of the critical things that are going on. Um, and that way you kind of look on the outside of the book and it kind of gives you like, oh yeah, this is where this one is going to have right. this stuff where I went out to the fire and um, we did that, 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 that burn. And, um, you know, there's, there's all that, that stuff on the, the, the burn because yeah. there's, there's that sticker on the front. And, uh, <laughs> you know, so that, that then connects you when you look on the outside of the book, it's kind of like, you know, an, an index of, um, you know, uh, that journal's greatest hits. Right. Yeah, I tend to put everything in these chronologically, but that's a horrible way to try to recall them. Yeah, hmm. I have the, yeah, the same problem. Um, I then have stickers on the back edges of them that tell me at least what year it is. Whoops, you can't see anything there. Um, yeah, there yeah. It is. Oh, there it is, yeah. That's a good yeah. idea. And also, just another excuse, I got a label maker, and I love me. <laughs> right? Like, I can, put, I can put labels on the back of my phone, right? Mm -hmm. And, I've done you know, the, um, I can, uh, so, uh, but this is, yeah, putting them on the, the dates gives me just an excuse. My yeah. label maker, you know, kind of, you know, geeking out like, I can even put them on my pens. <laughs> yeah, I've seen you use that. <laughs> That's yeah. I gotta. That that might be a little bit excessive, but I'm no. not going to do that. No, no, nope, it's fine. Yeah. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Um, let me see here. Um, Ray Bonto's got another thought or a comment for us, and then I think we will close it up for the day. Hey there. Just a question. Uh, why do you need to, why do you say in, on stone brand you need to draw on one side of the paper when you use pencil, when you, when you can use fixative? Ah, um, so if you do use fixative, then it's not as much of an issue. Um, but on a bunch of my paper where I drew on pencil on one page and then on the other head page I drew pencil, I found that I now have a bunch of, of journal pages where just everything is smeared together. And, um, you know, this page smears over onto that one and, and it's just, it's, it's sad. Um, but you're absolutely right. If you hit it with the fixative, that is not as much of a problem. Um, um, or if you're drawing with pen, then uh, that's that's not a problem because this page won't smear over onto that one. Uh, makes sense. All right, my friends. Um, thank you all for being here. I hope that um, you got some useful strategies out of today's class. Um, and 
that uh, you'll have a, 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 an opportunity to play with those in the upcoming week. Again, just the, the idea of, especially for you folks who are out there with, with snow and ice, see if you can get yourself crazy geeking out on some of those phenomena. And if you don't have snow and ice, find another phenomena that you don't understand and play and play and play and play. Um, we've got some strategies for playing with our tone paper. And um, I hope that those were, were really useful for you. The uh, want to just encourage people again to, although vaccines are rolling out, uh, remember that even if you've had the vaccine, it doesn't prevent you from getting the disease. So that's scary news flash. You still get the disease you don't get as bad symptoms from having the disease, but having the disease, you're gonna feel better. And um, if you're going around with it in your system, feeling better, then you're exposing other people to that. So even if you've had the vaccine, social distancing, keeping the masks going is still something that we need to do. What's going to happen though, so the, the good news on this front is you're like, is this, uh, is this the new normal? Maybe. Um, but there's also a very high likelihood that what's going to happen is that as, so when, when people have the vaccine in them, they get sick, their viral load is also much, much, much lower. It's much less likely that they will transmit the disease. As that happens in more of our population, the amount of COVID in our population goes down and down and down and down. And then there's a tipping point where um, transmission becomes much more difficult because there's just, you know, there's, there's, there's no happy hosts around. Um, so let's, as, as a community, a local and worldwide community, let's work together to do our part to really keep this, um, to, to, try to do our part to keep this COVID in check. Um, it is, again, really difficult to be alone during this time. And I want to encourage people to reach out um, to people in forums and communities like this, in things like Ivea's Pencil Miles and Chill. We can find that, uh, that community there. And um, it's gonna help us stay sane while we are still in this, this isolation and waiting for the sort of our, the, 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 the levels of this virus in our community to go down to a point where we can um, possibly return to a bunch of our, those, 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 those old practices. In the meantime, let's stay safe. Let's take care of each other as we take care of ourselves. And I um, thank you all for being here, for being part of this community for making such a friendly, accepting, and, and loving community. I was looking at some uh, just comments and posts on our Nature Journal Club Facebook page the other day. People were posting things and people were being just, there's um, a level of uh, not just people sort of saying, you know, positive things because it's nice to say positive things. People are really looking hard and being really useful and encouraging each other on. And I just, it's beautiful. And um, thank you all for making this community what it is. Be safe and uh, play in nature. Let's uh, get out there, connect with this natural world. I want to encourage you, um, if you see an opportunity in your community to, as Avea has done, to sort of step into a place of stewardship with um, nature near you, to let perhaps that be part of something that can become part of your routines and your family's routines. Um, if that is a little byproduct of COVID, we're gonna come out of this on the other side with sort of that part of things, maybe the world a little bit of a better place. So thank you all and take care. <laughs>